Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, great to be here. Amy, thank you for organizing all of this. Thank you all for coming out on this uh, cold and windy Minnesota morning. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to talk about my, uh, my new book, Thank You for Being Late, An Optimist Guide to Thriving in the Age of Acceleration. First question I always get from people is, uh, where from comes the title? Thank you for being late. And the title comes from having breakfast with people in Washington, D.C. Um, and uh, I don't like to waste breakfast um, uh, eating alone if I'm downtown, so I, um, uh, I, I try to arrange uh, meetings and people I can interview. And... Uh, over the years, uh, every once in a while, someone would come 10, 15 minutes late. And they'd say, Tom, I'm really sorry. It's the weather, the traffic, the subway, the dog ate my homework. And um, uh, one day, uh, one of them uh, did that, Peter Corsell, about three years ago. And um, I just spontaneously said to him, actually, Peter, thank you for being late. Because you were late, I've been eavesdropping on their conversation. <laughs> Fascinating. I've been people watching the lobby. Fantastic. And most importantly, I just connected two ideas I've been struggling with for a month. So thank you for being late. People started to get into it. They'd say, well, well, well you're welcome. <laughs> because they understood I was actually giving them permission to pause, to slow down, to reflect. In fact, my favorite quote in the opening chapter of the book is from my friend Dove Seidman, who says, when you press the pause button on a computer, it stops. But when you press the pause button on a human being, it starts. It starts to reflect, to rethink, and to reimagine. And boy, don't we need to be doing a lot of that right now. Now, the, the book was actually triggered uh, by actually a pause. When I paused to engage with someone who I probably wouldn't normally do. I live in Bethesda, Maryland, and uh, as I did today, I take the subway in about once a week. And uh, almost three years ago now, I did that, and um, I drive from my home on Bradley Boulevard to the Bethesda Hyatt, and I park in the public parking garage there, and I take the red line into to Farragut Square. And um, I did that uh, uh, some three years ago now, and uh, went to work, came back on the red line, got my car, time stamp ticket. Uh, drove to the cashier's booth, gave it to the cashier, and he looked at it and looked at me and said, I know who you are. I said, great. Uh, he said, I read your column. I said, great. Uh, he said, I don't always agree. I thought, get me out of here. Um, <laughs> but I, I actually said, that, that's wonderful. It means you always have to check. And I drove off. Uh, about a week later, I took my weekly subway trip in, Red line, office, red line back, car, timestamp ticket, cashier's booth, same guys there. Now this time he says, Mr. Friedman, I have my own blog. Would you read my blog? I thought, oh my God, the parking guy is now my competitor? <laughs> what? what just happened? So I said, well, write it down for me, and I'll look at it. So he wrote down on a piece of receipt paper, odinambi.com. And I took it home. I called it up on my computer. Uh, it turned out he was Ethiopian and wrote about Ethiopian politics. Um, uh, he's from the Oromo people and, uh, and obviously a real committed democracy advocate. And so I thought about him, told my wife about it. And I eventually concluded after a couple of days that this was a sign from God, and I should engage this guy. I should pause. But I did not have his email, so the only way I could do that was park in the parking garage every day, <laughs> uh, which I did um, uh, over uh, four or five days. I can't remember how many days it took me now. I, I uh, parked, and then one morning he was there, and I parked under the gate so it couldn't come down. I knew his name. Now I said, you, I want your email. I want to send you an email. And uh, that night I, I sent him an email. I, I shared our email exchange in the book because um, uh, some of them are, were funny. Um, and I said, uh, I basically said to him, I have a proposition for you. I will teach you how to write a column uh, if you tell me your life story. And he answered, basically, I see you're proposing a deal. I like this deal. Um, so he asked if we could meet uh, near his office. Uh, 
and uh, at Pete's Coffee House in Bethesda, across from the Bethesda Metro, uh, which we arranged to do two weeks later. And um, I came with a six-page memo on how to write a column. Uh, and he came with his life story. Uh, short version is uh, Ethiopian economics grad of a highly Selassie University, a uh, real democracy uh, activist for the Oromo people, um, uh, basically got thrown out of the country for his activism and pro-democracy work, was working at the garage just to make money because he was blogging on Ethiopian web platforms, but they wouldn't turn his stuff around fast enough, he said to me. So uh, he decided to start his own blog. And now he said, Mr. Friedman, I feel empowered. Uh, his Google metrics say he's read in 30 countries. This is my garage. This is my parking guy. Uh, and it's a wonderful tale of um, the ability of anyone to participate today in the global conversation. Well, I then um, presented him with a six-page memo on how to write a column, which we went over uh, in uh, several other sessions and online. I explained to him that a news story is meant to inform. I can write a news story about this event this morning. Uh, but a column is meant to provoke. Uh, I explained to him that I'm either in the heating business or the lighting business. That's uh, what I do. I'm either doing heating or lighting. Okay, I'm either stoking up an emotion in you or I'm illuminating something for you. And ideally, if I do both and produce heat and light, I really have a column. But I explained to him that to produce heat and light required a chemical reaction that you had to combine three compounds. The first was your value set. What is the value set of ideas you're trying to promote in the world? Are you a communist, a capitalist, a neocon, a neoliberal, a libertarian, a Marxist, a Keynesian? What is the value set you're pushing? Second, how do you think the machine works? So the machine is my shorthand for what are the biggest forces shaping more things in more places in more ways on more days? Because as a columnist, I'm always trying to take my values and push the machine in that direction. And if you don't know how the machine works, you won't either push it at all or you won't push it in the right direction. So all my books, to some degree, are an argument about how the machine is working, how the gears and pulleys of the world work. And lastly, what have you learned about people and culture? Because there's no column without people and there are no people without culture. How does the machine affect different people and culture? And how do different people and culture affect the machine? Stir those together, let it rise, bake for 45 minutes, and if you do it right, you'll produce a column that produces heat or light. And you'll know by the reactions you get. Because some readers may say, ah, I didn't know that, that's a good reaction. Some may say, I never looked at it that way, that's a good reaction. Uh, some may say, I never connected those things, that's a great reaction. Uh, your favorite, you live for this, happens four times a year. You said exactly what I felt but didn't know how to say. God, God bless you. God bless you. Um, I want to kill you dead, you and all your offspring. Um, that's a reaction you'll also get. Um, that will tell you you've produced heat or light. You know, the more I engaged with Ayile on this, the more I started to say to myself, well, if that's what a column's about, what's my value set? How do I think the machine works today? And what have I learned all these years about people and culture? And I decided that was the book I wanted to write. And so those of you who read my column know that I'm not exactly a liberal. I'm, I'm certainly not a conservative. Um, uh, because my politics, my value set actually does not emerge from a library or a philosopher. It actually grew out of the time and place in Minnesota where I grew up. Because uh, I grew up in a time and place where politics worked. And that has really informed um, how I write about the world. How do I think the machine works? What have I learned about people and culture? I decided to throw that all together. And that is the spine of this book. So let me go through the, the different parts very quickly. Um, uh, the first part is basically how the machine works. And um, my argument is that what is shaping more things in more places and more ways and more days today is that we are in the middle of three exponential accelerations all at the same time with the three largest forces on the planet, which I call the market, Mother Nature, and Moore's Law. So the market, um, uh, for me, is what I call digital globalization. Not your grandfather's globalization, containers on ships. That's actually going down. 
But the way everything now is being digitized and globalized, whether it's through Twitter or Facebook or MOOCs or PayPal, that's what's taking the world from interconnected to hyperconnected to interdependent. Second, Mother Nature. That's climate change, biodiversity loss, and population growth. If you put the market, digital globalization, on a graph, it looks like a hockey stick. If you put climate change, biodiversity loss, and population on a graph today, it looks like a hockey stick. And lastly, the Uber driver of them all is Moore's Law. Coined by Gordon Moore in 1965, the co-founder of Intel, Gordon Moore argued that the speed and power of microchips will double roughly every 24 months. Um, if you put it on a graph, it looks like a hockey stick. And the three are all intertwined. More Moore's Law, which is just a proxy for technology generally, drives more globalization. More globalization drives more climate change or more solutions to climate change. So these three giant accelerations, I argue, aren't just changing the world. They are fundamentally reshaping the world. And they're reshaping five realms in particular. Politics, geopolitics, the workplace, ethics, and community. So the first part of the book is about the accelerations, and the second half is about these five realms and how they have to be reimagined in the age of acceleration and how, how I see that. So I'm just going to talk about the first acceleration, the one in Moore's Law. So that chapter um, is called What the Hell Happened in 2007? 2007. Sounds like such an innocuous year, 2007. What's this guy talking about? Well, here's what happened in 2007. The year was kicked off by Steve Jobs at the Moscone Center in San Francisco when he unveiled the first iPhone, the 2G phone, beginning a process by which we are now putting into the hands of, we're on our way, to everyone on the planet, a handheld computer uh, connected to the internet. And in 2007, actually late 2006, a company called Facebook opened its platform to anyone with a registered email address and broke out of high schools and universities and in 2007 went global. In 2007, a company called Twitter, which was founded in 2006, also split off on its own independent platform and went global. Uh, in 2007, the most important software platform you've never heard of called Hadoop, uh, named after the founder's son's toy elephant, um, uh, opened its doors and set its algorithm into the wild. And Hadoop's algorithm is what enabled a million computers to work together as if they were one computer. And it gave us, really, the foundation of big data. Actually, Google gave us the foundation of big data, but it did so in a proprietary way. But as Doug Cutting, the founder of Hadoop, says, Google lives in the future and sends us letters back home. And what Google did was leave breadcrumbs of algorithms for the open source community to reverse engineer what Google had done. And that's what Hadoop did and basically gave that capability to everybody. In 2007, the second most important software program you've never heard of called GitHub uh, opened its doors. Uh, GitHub today is the largest repository of open source software uh, it has over 14 million users. It had 11 million when I started the book. Um, 2007, a company called Google uh, launched an open source operating system called Android. In 2007, this same company called Google bought an obscure TV company called YouTube. Uh, in 2007, Jeff Bezos of at Amazon.com uh, gave us the world's first ebook reader, the Kindle. In 2007, IBM launched the world's first cognitive computer called Watson. Uh, in 2007, three design students in San Francisco who were attending the World Design Conference that year decided to rent out their three spare air mattresses to people who couldn't get a hotel room. And it worked out so well for them, in 2007, they started Airbnb. Uh, in 2007, a company called VMware was launched. And it had an uh, algorithm to basically use software to virtualize servers and vastly expand the capability of that hardware by just using software. 
Uh, in 2007, AT&T, which was the first uh, service provider for the iPhone, uh, when uh, the iPhone was launched, Steve Jobs did not want any apps on it. He thought, I don't want any apps cluttering this phone. And that was fine with AT&T, so even though they sold a lot of iPhones, AT&T could handle the capacity. And a year later, Steve Jobs changed his mind and opened the App Store. And the demand on AT&T's network over the next six years grew 100,000%. Uh, have you ever seen anything that grew 100,000%? And to uh, absorb that capacity, AT&T virtualized its networks. It's basically its switches. And again, use software to vastly expand their hardware and accommodate a growth of 100 thousand percent, which began in 2007. Here's what else happened in 2007. This is a graph of sequencing the human genome cost. Uh, in 2001, it was $100 million. Uh, by uh, 2005 or so, it falls to $10 million. And then you'll notice it goes over a waterfall. Uh, if you trace your finger down to the year, it's 2007. Isn't that interesting? Uh, this is growth of solar power. It begins to take off in 2007. Also in 2007, a process for extracting natural gas from tight shale called fracking began. This is, uh, this is a graphic picture of social networks. Um, the white line at the top that goes straight down in uh, uh, 2007, um, that is the uh, a cost of gen generating a megabit of data. Um, Facebook. Twitter, all those things, those are massive megabits of data. You'll notice in 2007, it goes straight down. Uh, the blue line going up is the speed at which you can transmit this data. Um, this is a graphic picture of, of social networking. Uh, the two lines cross there in 2008. Close enough for government work. Um, that's what Moore's Law looks like. That's the power of an exponential. One of the hardest things for the human mind to grasp which is what we're in the middle of, is the power of an exponential. In fact, uh, Intel's engineers back in, uh, uh, right around, um, actually it was a couple of years ago, they, um, to demonstrate the power of Moore's Law, they said, what if we took a 1971 VW Beetle, and um, what if it improved at the same rate of our microchips? So their engineers on the back of an envelope calculated that if the 1971 VW Beetle improved at the same rate of microchips on Moore's Law, today it would go 300,000 miles per hour, it would get 2 million miles per gallon, and it would cost 4 cents. And you'd be able to drive it your entire life on one tank of gas. That's the power of something doubling, doubling, and doubling. And we now are in the middle of the really big doubling. This is, oh, I forgot. What else started in 2007? This is a graph of cloud computing. Let's see, the first year it shows up is uh, 2008. That means it started in 2007. And in 2007, of course, Intel, for the first time, went off silicon to uh, uh, extend the exponential of Moore's Law, it introduced non-silicon materials into its transistors, which turned out to be a huge, huge accelerator. Turns out, 2007 may in time be understood as the single greatest technological inflection point since Gutenberg invented the printing press. And we completely missed it because of 2008. So right when our physical technologies suddenly just leapt ahead, like we were on a moving sidewalk in an airport that went from five miles an hour to 35 miles an hour, like overnight, and we all felt the ground moving beneath our feet, right when that happened, all our, what Eric Beinhacker calls our social technologies, the regulating, the deregulating, the political reform, the economic reform, the management, the learning you needed to get the most out of this acceleration and cushion the worst, a lot of that just froze. And we're living in that dislocation right now. So I was out at Google X talking about this with Astro Teller. Astro Teller is chief astronaut at Google X, their research um, and uh, their research lab. So 
Astor went over to uh, his whiteboard and drew this abstraction. Uh, that blue line across the middle, he said, is the average rate at which human beings and societies adapt to change over time. So it has a positive slope, but it's very gradual. Uh, the white line we'll call technology or Moore's law. So if you were at the left end of this line, if you were in the 11th century or the 12th century, your life basically didn't change over a century. We forget there are times where life did not change over an entire century. And then we got Copernicus and Galileo and uh, da Vinci and, and eventually Gordon Moore and Intel, and the line goes straight north. And then Astro drew a little diamond there, and he wrote the words, we are here. That is, we're now at a place, excuse me, where the change in the pace of change now, because of the constant doubling, is faster than the average human being in society can adapt to. Then he added, uh, got another magic marker out, and he added that dotted line. Uh, and he wrote, learning faster and governing smarter. How do we lift the adaptation line to meet technology where it is? And that's the essential challenge that we face today. How did all this happen? Basically, what produced 2007 is the fact that your computer has essentially five parts. It has the CPU, the processor, the Moore's Law microchip. It also has a storage chip. It has networking, it has software, and it has a sensor. It just has a camera, but sensors are going everywhere now. The fact is, all five have been in a Moore's Law um, and accelerating. And in 2007, they all melded into this thing we call the cloud. The cloud. But I refuse to use the word the cloud in my book because it, it sounds so fluffy. It sounds, it sounds so soft, so cuddly. It sounds like a Joni Mitchell song. I've looked at clouds from both sides now. This ain't no cloud, folks. This is a supernova. Uh, the supernova is the largest force in nature. It's the explosion of a star. And what we're in the middle now what is driving everything now is an ever larger supernova explosion. This is the energy source that now is driving everything. Where did you want to build your town in the Middle Ages? If the Metropolitan Division of Brookings existed in 1500, what advice would Amy be giving people? She'd say, build your town on a river, because it'll give you transportation, it'll give you energy, It'll give you ideas, and it'll give you nourishment. You wanted to build your town on the Amazon. Where do you want to build your town today? On Amazon.com. Okay. <laughs> you want to build it on the supernova. You want to build it on the flows coming out of the supernova. Because they are really now the energy source driving everything. So what this supernova has done is basically change four kinds of power very quickly. It's changed the power of one. Wow, what one person can do now has been super empowered. We have a president-elect who can sit in his penthouse and tweet to hundreds of millions of people in his pajamas, okay, any hour of the day, and they will receive that message unfiltered by the New York Times or anybody else, unmediated. But that's not what's really cool, cool in inverted commas. The head of ISIS can do the same thing from Raqqa province. The power of one has just exploded. The power of machines has exploded. Machines now have all five senses. They can now think. I spoke at IBM's developer, Watson Developer Conference uh, last month, and the day before I got there, they told me that Watson had just co-written with Alex the Kid, a song that in 48 hours went to number four on iTunes. In fact, I would say February 14, 2011 was a, that was a pretty much an important day in history. Um, and it happened, of all places, on a game show. Um, there were three contestants. Uh, two were the all-time Jeopardy champions, and the third just went by his last name, Watson. Uh, Mr. Watson passed on the first question. But on the second question, he buzzed in before the two humans. Uh, and the question was, it's worn on the foot of a horse and used by a dealer in a casino. And in under 2.5 seconds, Mr. Watson said, in perfect Jeopardy language, what is shoe? What is shoe? And for the first time, we saw a cognitive computer figure out a pun faster than two human beings. The world kind of hasn't been the same since. 
You know, someone was around when Gutenberg invented the printing press. And some monk probably did say to some priest, now that is really cool. Uh, I don't have to write these Bibles out longhand anymore. Uh, we just stamp, stamp these out. Okay. Well, I kind of think you're here for a similar moment. Okay. So these accelerations, they're not just changing the world. They're reshaping the world. And they're reshaping these five realms that I talked about, and that's the second half of the book. They're reshaping politics, geopolitics, ethics, the workplace, and community. So let me just talk a little bit about a, a few of them. How are they shaping the workplace? Well, that chapter in my book um, uh, is called How We Turn AI into IA. How do we take artificial intelligence and turn it into intelligent assistance, A-N-C-E, intelligent assistance, A-N-T-S, and intelligent algorithms so more people can live above the line? and thrive in an age of acceleration. So my example of intelligent assistance is the HR policy today of AT&T. Giant company, 360,000 employees, living on the edge of the supernova, feels its heat every morning, competes with Verizon, T-Mobile, Sprint. There's a good chance what AT&T is doing in its HR department is going to come to a neighborhood near you. Well, here's AT&T's HR policies in a nutshell. Uh, they begin the year with their CEO, Randall Stevenson, giving a radically transparent speech about where the company is going, how they see their business environment, and what skills you need to be a worker at AT&T. That filters down throughout the company. Then they put every employee on their own link, in-house LinkedIn system. So they know just what skills you have and how they match up with where the company is going. And then they've got Amy, Lou, the Amy, Amy, Amy. If there are 10 different skill sets you need to be a successful worker at AT&T, they come to Amy and say, Amy, you're doing well. You got seven of them. You're doing well, but you're missing three. Uh, then they partnered with Sebastian Thrun, the founder of Udacity, and um, got him to develop nano degrees for all 10. Then they came to Amy and said, Amy, here's the deal. Uh, we will give you up to $8,500 a year to take these courses for the skill sets you're missing. Um, and uh, we'll, we, we will pay for that. But there's just one catch. You have to take them on your own time. You have to take them on your own time. By the way, one of these courses is a one-year online computer science master's degree from Georgia Tech for $6,000. Now, if Amy says, you know what? I've actually climbed up one too many telephone poles. I just, I'm not up for this. They now have a wonderful severance package for Amy, but Amy's not going to be working much longer for AT&T. What is AT&T saying to its workers? What is the new social contract? Their contract is with Amy. If she takes those courses, they will make sure she gets offered the new jobs first, inside, that they don't go outside. But their message is, you can now be a lifelong employee at AT&T, but only if you're a lifelong learner. You can be a lifelong employee, but only if you're a lifelong learner. That is the social contract coming to a neighborhood near you. And as I describe it in the book, there are three new social contracts here. But, uh, the employer, I think, has an obligation to create the learning opportunities and the resources for employees to do it. Amy has a new obligation. If she wants to work there, she has to have a different social contract with herself. I've got to take these courses on my own time. I've got to be a lifelong learner. And I think government's job is to nurture and inspire all of these kinds of social contracts for the workers of the 21st century. Intelligent assistant, my example of that is um, Qualcomm, another really important company you probably haven't focused on much. It made the inside of your cell phone. Um, that Apple actually didn't make that. The software and motherboard of your cell phone uh, was most likely made by Qualcomm and their founder, uh, Erwin Jacobs, and I tell Erwin's story, actually, in the, in the book early on. So Qualcomm has a 64-building campus in San Diego, and um, two years ago, they put sensors on six of their buildings as a, as a beta test, and they put sensors on everything, every toilet, every faucet, every window, every door, every light bulb, every computer, uh, every refrigerator. They know everything going on in those buildings. And then they beamed all that data up to the supernova, and then they beamed it down onto iPads with a very friendly user interface for their janitors. 
Um, and they can now swipe down if Amy leaves her computer on, they know. Uh, if a pipe bursts outside her office, they know immediately. They swipe down how to fix it, who to call. The repair manual is there. Their janitors now have an intelligent assistant. Their janitors are now maintenance technologists. Their janitors now give tours to foreign visitors. Think what that does for the dignity of a janitor, that they now have an intelligent assistant helping them live above the line. Lastly, intelligent algorithm. That's the partnership between Khan Academy and the College Board, the people who administer the PSAT and SAT exams. So um, uh, I'm a, um, a neurotic suburban parent, and like um, many others, uh, my kids went to public school out in Bethesda, and um, when they were in 11th grade and had to take the PSAT and SAT a year later, we went out and hired a tutor for $200 an hour uh, to goose up their um, uh, English and math scores. Don't worry, I know most of you did it as well. It's okay. <laughs> a completely rigged game. A completely rigged game. Because if you had the resources, you could do this. And if you, if you came from a disadvantaged family or neighborhood, you probably didn't even know the possibility was there. But even if you did, you couldn't afford it. A completely rigged game. So two, uh, uh, over two years ago now, the College Board and, and Sal Khan, the founder of Khan Academy, the online learning platform, created free SAT and PSAT college prep. Now what happens is Amy takes the PSAT in 11th grade, she gets her results back, and they say, Amy, 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 uh, you did well. You, you really did well, but you have a problem with fractions and right angles. Uh, the site then takes Amy to a practice site just for fractions and right angles dedicated specifically and only to her weaknesses. They don't waste time on her strengths. If Amy does well, takes her to another site that says, Amy, have you ever heard of AP Math? Believe it or not, a lot of kids haven't. There's no one in their world who has taken AP Math. You could take AP Math in 12th grade. Then it takes her to another site that's got 180, probably more now, college scholarships. And then it takes her to another site that offers her coaching from volunteers from the Boys and Girls Clubs of America. That's an intelligent algorithm. Last year, 2 million kids in America participated in free SAT and PSAT, PSAT college prep through that intelligent algorithm. Now, you would know nothing about any of these things if you had followed our last election campaign. You would know nothing about that. Bernie Sanders' big idea was to tear down the banks. Do you think that was going to lift anybody up the line? Donald Trump's big idea was to tear down Hillary Clinton. And Hillary Clinton's big idea was to direct you to her website. But no one was telling people what's actually going on inside communities and companies all over America, and it's massive social entrepreneurship on the education to work pipeline. And what I've just given you are three examples. I've got so many more in that chapter. It'll blow your socks off. The amount of social entrepreneurship, the number of people with their thinking caps on trying to work this problem. So that's how we turn AI into IA. Uh, my chapter on politics uh, is called Mother Nature's Political Party. And um, uh, I call it that because I, I don't think we're just in the middle of one climate change right now, change in the climate. I think we're in the middle of three climate changes at once. We're in the middle of a change in the climate of the climate. We're in the middle of a change of the climate of politic, of, of technology, excuse me. And we're in the middle of a change of the climate of uh, globalization. We're in the middle of three fundamental climate changes at once. What do you want when the climate changes? You want two things. You want resilience. You want to be able to take a blow. And you want propulsion. You want to be able to move ahead. You don't want to just be curled up in a ball. So I thought, well, who, who do I interview? about how you produce resilience and propulsion when the climate changes. And then I realized I, I know a woman as she's 3.8 billion years old, and her name's Mother Nature, and she's dealt with more climate changes than anybody. So why don't I call her, and um, we'll do an interview. So I called Mother Nature, I sat her down, and I said, Mother Nature, how do you produce resilience and propulsion when the climate changes? And she said, well, Tom, first of all, everything I do, I do unconsciously, I have to tell you. Um, but um, uh, first of all, she said, I'm incredibly adaptive uh, in a brutal way through natural selection. 
But in my world, only the adaptive survive. Uh, secondly, she said, I, um, I, I just love pluralism. She said, I, I, um, I love diversity. My most diverse ecosystems are my most resilient ecosystems. I like to try 20 different species and see, see what happens. Third, she says, I'm incredibly sustainable uh, in a very circular way. Everything is food. Eat food, poop seed. Eat food, poop seed. Everything, I, nothing is wasted in my, my world. Um, fourth, she said, I'm incredibly entrepreneurial. Wherever I see an opening, I fill it with a plant or animal perfectly adapted to that niche. I'm incredibly entrepreneurial. Fifth, she said, I'm incredibly heterodox. I mix all kinds of things together. I think things are most strong when they co-evolve. I put the right bees with the right flowers. I put the right trees with the right soils. I'm incredibly, incredibly heterodox. Uh, lastly, she said, I do believe in the laws of bankruptcy. I kill all my failures. I return them to the great manufacturer in the sky. And I take their energy to nourish my successes. So my argument is that the political party, the community, the company, the country that most closely mirrors Mother Nature's strategies for building resilience and propulsion in, in the age of acceleration will be the one that's most sustainable. And then just for the fun of it, I thought, what would happen, what would it look like if Mother Nature was running in this election? And Mother Nature had a political party. And I produced her 18-point platform for building resilience and propulsion in the age of acceleration. I won't go into it. It's in the book. But um, uh, it's, it's just a proxy, really, for my politics. Um, and, uh, 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 and you will see when you, when you look it over, that on some issues, I'm actually to the left of Bernie Sanders. I think we should have single-payer health care if Sweden can do it and Singapore can do it. I fail to understand why we can't do it. And on other issues, I'm actually to the right of the Wall Street Journal editorial page because I believe we should abolish all corporate taxes and replace them with a carbon tax, a tax on sugar, a tax on bullets, and a small financial transaction tax. I think we should get radically entrepreneurial over here in order to pay for the safety nets and trampolines we're going to need over here because the age of acceleration is going to just be too damn fast for more people. Now, the idea of co-evolving safety nets and radical entrepreneurialism simply is impossible in our two-party system. If you're for safety nets, you're never for radical entrepreneurialism. If you're radical for, for radical entrepreneurialism, you're never for safety nets. Although one thing you have to give Trump credit for, he actually is... Uh, an agent of disruption of this model. And I think he's just the beginning because I think all these political parties are going to blow up. And for my money, they can't go fast enough. Um, and I'm not just talking about ours. I think all across the industrial world uh, because these parties were designed to answer different and older questions. They were designed to answer questions of the New Deal, the Industrial Revolution, the early IT revolution, and civil rights, both racial and gender. And I think the question you have to answer today as a political party is how you respond to these three accelerations, how you get the most out of them, and how you cushion the worst. Um, let me conclude by talking about a chapter in the book that might surprise you, which is why ethics have to be completely rethought in the age of acceleration. Uh, the chapter is called, Is God in Cyberspace? Uh, which comes from actually the best question I ever got on book tour. I was 1999 selling Lexus in the olive tree, Portland, Oregon, man stands up in the balcony at question time, says, Mr. Friedman, I have a question. Is God in cyberspace? And I thought, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, I have no idea. Never been asked that before. So I was really embarrassed. I went home, called my spiritual teacher. Uh, his name is Rabbi Tzvi Marx. I got to know him when I was the New York Times correspondent in Jerusalem. Uh, at the Hartman Institute. He lives in Amsterdam, married to a Dutch priest. Very interesting guy. I called him in Amsterdam. I said, Svi, I got a question I've never had before. Is God in cyberspace? What should I have answered? And he said, well, Tom, um, in our faith tradition, we have two concepts of the Almighty, a biblical and a post-biblical view. The biblical view is the Almighty is Almighty. He smites evil and rewards good. And if that's your view of God... He sure isn't in cyberspace, which is full of pornography, gambling, cheating, lying, prevarication, and now we know fake news, okay? <laughs> but he said, fortunately, we have a post-biblical view of God, 
that says God manifests himself by how we behave. So if we want God to be in cyberspace, we have to bring him there by how we behave there. Well, I took his answer, I put it into the paperback edition of Lexus and the Olive Tree, where nobody saw it. And um, I basically forgot about it. 20 years later, I'm working on this book, and suddenly I start retelling that story to people. And I say to myself, why are you retelling that story? And then it became immediately obvious to me. Because everything's moving to cyberspace. That's not where we date, where we find a spouse, where we meet our friends, where we do our business, where we educate. What does that mean? It means our lives are migrating to a realm where we're all connected, but nobody's in charge. Our lives are moving to a realm where we're all connected, but nobody is in charge. And boy, didn't we see that in this election, which I think is a tipping point in our awareness of what's happened. We got hacked by another country. Who do I call? 911, Putin hacked me, okay? Um, fake news, who do I call, you know? 911, who do I call in cyberspace? We're all connected. We're, do, we're living our lives now in a realm where we're all connected and nobody's in charge. It's not like here if you run a red light. So the question of ethics now becomes really important because when you combine that with this amplified individual power in an interdependent world, this can get really scary. You see, friends, we are now standing at a moral intersection. We have never stood at before as a human species. In 1945, we entered a world where one country could kill all of us. If it had to be one country, post Hiroshima, I'm glad it was ours. I think we're heading for a world with these accelerations where one person can kill all of us. And all of us could actually fix everything. We have actually never been to this intersection before where one of us could kill all of us. And if we put our minds to it, all of us could feed, house, clothes, and educate now with these amplified powers, everyone on the planet. We have never been at a place where one of us could kill all of us and all of us could fix everything. What does that mean? It means we've never been more godlike as a species. And if we are going to be godlike, oh, we all better have the golden rule. Every faith has their version of it. Do unto others as you wish them to do unto you. I know what you're thinking. You see, I gave this talk as the commencement address at Olin College of Engineering last May. And I said to the parents there, I know what you're thinking. You paid 200 grand so your kid could get an engineering degree. And they brought in a knucklehead commencement speaker <laughs> who's advocating the golden rule. Could there be anything more naive? And I'm here to tell you that naivete is the new realism. Oh, baby, you want to know what's really naive? Really naive is thinking we're all just going to be fine if everyone doesn't get the golden rule. So where does the golden rule come from? Where do you learn to do unto others as you wish them to do unto you? It comes from two places, in my view. It comes from family, strong families and healthy communities. That's where you really learn the golden rule. Now, I'm not an expert on strong families. I Hopefully I built one, but I would never presume to lecture anyone on that subject. But I am an expert on healthy communities because I grew up in one. Uh, and that's why the book ends with the story of my little town slash suburb in Minneapolis called St. Louis Park. So the short story is that in Minneapolis in the 30s, at 40, Minneapolis was the capital of anti-Semitism in America in the 30s and 40s. My parents couldn't join AAA, among other discriminatory practices, until Hubert Humphrey became mayor, and he cleaned up the city government, a real hero in our household, he and Fritz Mondale. In the 30s, 40s, and 50s, the Jews in Minnesota, most of them lived in a ghetto with African Americans in the north side of Minneapolis, called the north side. And after the war, the world opens up a little bit, and the Jews are able to get out of the ghetto, and in a three-year period, they all leave for one suburb, St. Louis Park, which is the one that didn't have either restrictive covenants and had enough housing stock in order to take all these people. So overnight, a town that was 100% white, Protestant, Catholic, Scandinavian becomes 20% Jewish, 80% white, Protestant, Catholic, Scandinavian. If, if Sweden and Israel had a baby, it would be St. Louis Park, okay? <laughs> And um, what happened was 
an incredible experiment in inclusion. Um, these neurotic Jews shot out of the ghetto, um, basically mixing with these very decent pluralistic Scandinavians. And uh, I tell the story of how they did it. And there were ups and downs, and there were broken friendships and broken dates and broken hearts, uh, but there was also an enormous amount of bridge building. And we, we the Jews of Minnesota, who called ourselves the frozen chosen, um, uh, found our way with these um, uh, really decent Swedes uh, to build a remarkable community. Uh, I went to high school or Hebrew school or grew up in the same time and town with the Cone brothers, Al Franken, Norm Ornstein, Michael Sandel, Sharon Isbin, the guitarist, Peggy Ornstein, Alan Wiseman. Uh, look it up on your Wikipedia page. This was not a neighborhood in the west side of New York. This was a one high school town in Minnesota. It shot us all like a cannon out into the world, all with a real sense of the importance of civic engagement, which we each expressed in different ways. The Coen Brothers movie, A Serious Man, was about our town and our, our, uh, our Hebrew school, basically. So I tell that story. And the last chapter is I come back 40 years later. I had left Minnesota in 1971 to discover the world, and I come back 40 years later and find that the world has discovered St. Louis Park. Now my high school is 50% white, Protestant, Catholic, Scandinavian. It's 10% Jewish, 10% Hispanic, and now 30% Somali and African American. The same suburb that was ready to take the Jews took the Somalis. Now the inclusion challenge, much harder. Both racially and religiously, the divides that have to be bridged to build citizens in a community much deeper. And I tell the story about how they're doing. And they're doing actually remarkably well. The Washington Post rates my high school. St. Louis Park High today is, I forgot, it's in the book, but the fifth or sixth best high school in the state of Minnesota with a completely different demographic. And I basically explain how this happened. And it's a big part of the story is leadership. If you visit St. Louis Park, you will, you will notice, and uh, Amy's been there, it's completely indistinguishable from all the other suburbs. There is no moat around it. There's no drawbridge. There's no wall. And yet its culture is radically different from every suburb around it. And the reason is leadership. It was blessed with amazing leaders back in the 50s. And they passed on a leadership and inclusion culture, and they just kept passing it down. Till today, we're only 15% of the families in that community that now have kids in the public school. And every bond issue for raising taxes for public education passes 70, 30, or 80, 20. So what do I see there? And it's part of a larger story that Amy and I will talk about. If you want to be an optimist today in America, stand on your head. Because the country looks so much better from the bottom up than from the top down. Okay. <laughs> And what you see um, are healthy communities all over this country trying to get it right. We also have lots of unhealthy communities. I have no illusions about this. But there are many more success stories than you would realize. And these success stories are built. My friend Amy Lovins, the physicist, who was my tutor for all the biology in this book, and there's a lot of biology, Amory likes to say when he's asked, are you an optimist or a pessimist? Amory says, I'm neither, because they're just two different forms of fatalism. Everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be awful. Amory says, I believe in applied hope. And I love that phrase. Because what I see in Minneapolis, in my own little town, man, I don't know if they're going to make it. I really don't know. But I see a lot of people applying hope. I see big problems, but I see a lot of people who want to get caught trying to fix things. And that's the source of the optimism in the title of this book. So let me end with the book's theme song. My book has a theme song. Um, I explored, could I buy this? So when you open the book, it would play this song like a Hallmark card plays, Happy Birthday. Uh, and the song is called I, E-Y-E. -E. It's by one of my favorite singers, Brandy Carlisle, great country folk singer. And the main refrain is, I wrapped your love around me like a chain, but I never was afraid that it would die. You can dance in a hurricane, but only if you're standing in the eye. You see, I think what we're being asked to do today, friends, is dance in a hurricane, my three accelerations. Uh, we have leaders today who are advocating that we build a wall against 
these winds of change. My argument is you have to build an eye, an eye that moves with the storm, draws energy from it, but creates a platform of dynamic stability within it. That's the healthy community where more people can feel connected, protected, and respected. I think the great struggle in our politics in the next four years is going to be between the wall people and the eye people. And my book is a manifesto for the eye people. Thank you very much.